Welcome to From the Shed End, episode 36. It feels like a long time ago that we recorded episode 35. We've had the international break. It's out the way. I think that's the last international break now until March, which is brilliant yeah. news. We've Hallelujah. Lot, yeah, we've got a lot of football to get through now. So um, as always, I'm T-Dot, um, joined with my co-hosts, Theo and Hayda. How are you both doing? Doing well, doing well, thank you. Doing well, thank yeah. you. Good, doing good, thanks. Um, glad the international break's over and looking forward to the Premier League fixtures over the weekend. Yeah, and technically you didn't really miss much because you was away. You went to, to Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Sunny sunny Portugal. Lucky for some, right? Yeah, it was very <laughs> sunny. Walking around in a t-shirt um, all day and obviously for us Chelsea fans, it's got quite a symbolic you know, value to it as well. So well, I did a stadium tour of the Estadio de Dragao, which was honestly very, very special. I love that. Uh, 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 yeah, I visited a lot of football stadiums in my life, but just being in that stadium where we won the Champions League back in May, it was special. And I never knew this, but you, the only dressing room that they can show you on the tour is the away dressing room. Because, you know, since the 70s, there's some kind of superstition that they don't want anyone other than the players in the home dressing room. And Chelsea were given the away dressing room on the, for the Champions League final. So, you know, being in that dressing room where they actually, you know, celebrated who did the champagne shower, Alonso drank out of Tuchel's shoe. It just it felt very special. And then the actual stadium itself was really nice. And the tour guide almost didn't even look surprised that I was wearing a Chelsea kit. I think he's used to it now, getting a lot of Chelsea fans <laughs> yeah. do, the, do the stadium tour. So, um, yeah, if you're a Chelsea fan and you're in Porto, I highly recommend it. And you'll probably get goosebumps like me. And then that links into, obviously, um, two-part documentary that I haven't watched yet. I'm quite embarrassed to say that I haven't watched it um, on the fifth stand. I've, I don't. I think Theo, I know you've definitely watched it. I've I have. watched one episode. I've watched the first episode. Yeah. Episode See, two will have you in tears. It will have you in tears. I think. I mean, I emotional think, tears. I don't think I'm ready for that, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> Get the tissue box. <laughs> I was waiting for episode two to come out so I could watch them both back to back. So now that they're out, that's my my Friday afternoon sorted. Yeah. I'm gonna watch them right after the recording. I'm gonna throw throw it on, get some lunch, watch the two of them back to back, and. Just enjoy the moment. Like, I think the full match is on there again as well on the fifth stand, which is always a joy to watch as well. Um, it's it's weird because you know when I think back on on the day of the final, I don't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, we said <laughs> it's, the same. So it's all just it's just a blur. You know what I mean? <laughs> just so emotional. And then my local team Brentford got promoted as well. Right. Okay. So it's a win. Uh, so it was all just football crazy that day, and it was just you know. But now I haven't actually had a time to sit down and watch it over again. I might have to do that too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I rewatched it the day after. I was really hungover, so I had to watch it like four or five <laughs> times. But um, yeah, it's definitely one that you just, whenever you get a chance to watch it, you've got to just get straight back into it. Be it would be nice rewatching it knowing that Amara's chance doesn't go in this time, you know? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good for the heart, yeah. good for the heart. <laughs> definitely, definitely. But let, let's take it straight back to the Premier League. It's a big game coming up. Um, Leicester, King Power. If I'm memory serves me right I don't think we've won there since 2017 2-0 James Madison Sorry. and Ndidi I think in the Premier League I think we've won in the FA Cup um, so it's kind of a ground where we haven't really had the best of luck in terms of the league there um, some obviously big missing factors I thought Lukaku would be back for this game it seems like he's out he, he's potentially going to be on the bench for Tuesday's game against Juventus and potentially play some part in that one but Kovacic being another big sort of absentee in the game, but there is some returns for the for the squad. We've got Mason Mount who missed the internationals, I think, due to some toothache or something along those lines. We've also got um, who else is back? I did write this down. I don't know why I'm trying to remember. Werner. Werner's at Werner's a doubt. Apparently, he's he's going to have a training session this morning. Okay. And they're going to assess him. Uh, Kai Havertz, who again missed one of the games. I think it was Liechtenstein, but played the other one. So he's Can't back take in. It. Kante should be fit as well, and Pulisic, yeah. Pulisic as well. He's he's yeah, fit as well. Fit. So he's come back and he's not injured. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That was the main thing, wasn't it? That is the main thing. So, um, I'll get I'll get both your thoughts. I'll start with you, Haido, as well. First, um, what's your thoughts on a Leicester a Leicester team, which I think has got also got injuries? I think Tillemans is out. I think you mentioned that earlier this week as well. Um, James Madison's a doubt as well. So two big sort of key players for Leicester out. What's your thoughts on the game? I always think when, when you come back to such a big game after the internationals, you have to keep some sort of reality to the situation. Ideally, we'd like to go in and win 3-4-0, but 
I don't think that's realistic right now. For me, coming out with a win, just any sort of win, even if it's a 1-0, even if it's not a dominated performance, that's the priority right now. Um, we haven't got our main boys up front again, Lukaku and, uh, and Lukaku and Werner. And for that, we need to just stick to how we've been going in the previous games, you know, just trying to grind wins out. I don't think it's been the prettiest on the eye. Um, and like like you mentioned as well, Tielemans being out is huge. I don't know if you've watched Leicester this year, but he's literally the catalyst in that in that in that midfield. He, he defensively scores pretty amazing goals as well out of nowhere. He just has that kind of ice cold mentality of pulling out something from the back out of nothing. Um, so ideally, a solid one nil victory, bring that back to the bridge, and 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 I'm happy with that personally. What's your thoughts, Theo? Yeah, I mean, you kind of mentioned our record against Leicester at the King Power. It's not great. Um, now that I'm remembering, my memory serves me right, last win was in August, or maybe even September, August 2000, uh, 2017, 2-1, I think. Kante scored, I remember, and Leicester fans started booing him. Um, I think we won there in uh, twice, actually, in the FA Cup since then. But Premier League record's not great. However, if there's a season to beat Leicester, I think it's this year. You know, they, they, they're they playing a lot of European football. A lot of their players now are international, so they've travelled, you know, with, the Euro- with their international teams. There'll be a bit of fatigue in their squad. They've got injuries like us, and um, they're not performing like they were in the last maybe year or two in the Premier League. But then again, you know, after the international break, a lot can happen, so I'm still expecting a very, very tough game. Like Ida said, I would take a 1-0. I'd take a scrappy 2-1. I think both teams will have a goal in them, so it could even end up being a draw. But, um, you know, if those players that do play and do start, um, you know, like the Hudson Adoys, the Loftus Cheeks, if they do start, they'll have a point to prove and they want to go out, you know, and give um, give 100%. So that gives me a bit more confidence, you know, now that everybody's almost fighting for their for their spot in the team. Whoever starts will do the job. So I do think we can win. Um, then again, you know, I hate, I hate these games after the international break because, you know, there might be a bit of rustiness in the team. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he, even if he starts some of those players that maybe didn't travel, you know, the likes of Ross Barkley, Hudson Odoi, um, a Loftus Cheek, maybe I always say this, but maybe even a Sal Naguez potentially, I, which probably is very unlikely. But um, Trevor Chalaber being another one, I think we saw it. I think it was was it the Southampton game where it was one game Trevor Chalaber started straight after the international break. I think it might have been the Brentford one actually. Um, so yeah, I'm expecting a very tough game, but um, you know, I think Leicester, if there's one season to beat them. And one, one season where Chelsea look a lot more support, superior as this year. So um, I think we'll get the three points, hopefully. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be difficult. I think Leicester are always a team that you don't really know which Leicester's going to turn up, especially this season as well. I think, you know, they've had a roller coaster season so far with some of the results, but they've got it in the locker to to, to bring out the A team when it, that it requires it, you know, and we know what Jamie Vardy's about. Um, they've got some good. I think Adelome and Lutman's there now as well, so he's a, a good player that they've got in that sort of position that they've kind of got injuries to as well. So I'm sure he'll he'll play a big part. But I, I agree. I think you know um, it'd be interesting to see how we line up um, because I think I know Thiago Silva travelled with Brazil, didn't he? And didn't play, didn't feature in any of the, in the, any game. So he's just travelled and travelled back. So I think Tuchel again has sort of assessed that and realised that he could potentially use him in the game, but you've still got that travel in you, you know, traveling is just as bad as playing a match, especially that far, mm. going that far out. So it's, it's going to be interesting how we line up. Um, I'd be interested to see if he uses what he did in the FA Cup in terms of using um, Aspi Equator and um, Reese James in those positions. And and I think at one point he switched over, didn't he, and put Reese James at the, the right centre-back to, to basically deal with Vardy's pace um, in that final. So it's going to be interesting how we line up. I'd like to see Trevor Chalabar back in there as well I think that'll be um, a good game for him to come into and I agree with you test out some of the players that potentially didn't need to travel or haven't travelled as far or you know but I, I think he'll I think he'll put out a strong squad I don't think there'll be a Sal Niguez in there I think he'll he'll try and put out as many of the key this is a game that realistically you don't want to lose and I, I get I think when we did um, last season I think it was West Brom last year where we got hammered after an international break and um, I think Tuchel will want to get a win, um, especially with the, the fixtures coming up as well. We've got United around the corner as well, so it's going to be interesting. But I was going to ask you as well around Lukaku. Obviously, he's, he's been out for for a while now. Do, do you think, obviously, Havertz scored um, last Chelsea goal, 
scored in the midweek for for Germany as well. Can, can he do it against a, a resilient centre back in, in in Leicester's centre backs? Because they are quite good. I mean, you know, we talk about Wesley Fofana on here. I like Sionchu as well. I think he's a good centre back. But can, can can Havertz do the job when it matters? Should I go first or? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> I mean, we, I think he can. He's done it in a Champions League final against probably the best defence in European football in Man City, you know, Diaz, Laporte and Stones. He did it against Liverpool at Anfield, a lovely header against, again, a very good you know, centre-back in Van Dijk. I think he can easily do it against Leicester. I think what Havertz offers is very different to Lukaku. Lukaku is more of a target man, even though he does create chances for himself. Whereas Hazard, um, Hazard, sorry, I'm going ahead of myself. Havertz is, <laughs> is um, you know, he's thinking. <laughs> I think he's got a bit more, you know, skills in him. And we saw that in that Real Madrid second leg last season, you know, almost creating these chances, you know, thinking it over the goalkeeper at times. So I think he is capable of doing it against the Fafana and I don't know who's the other centre back now. Is it Johnny Evans? I don't see Chu or Vestergaard. And, you know, I'd expect whoever, if it's Havertz who starts, um, which is probably most likely, um, because Lukaku's not fit, then I think he he has, does have a goal in him. He'll be, he scored against Burnley, another lovely header. I, I do like, I think I mentioned it previously, what Havertz is offering a lot more now as a number nine is, you know, his aerial ability. He's scoring a lot more goals. So I think against Southampton, we saw it against um, Liverpool, we saw it. And against Burnley, we saw it. So um, if he gets a goal on um, tomorrow, I think it will be a header, especially, you know, with the crossing that we can uh, we can provide with Rhys James, potentially even Alonso or Chilwell on the left. Um, but then I think as well, this Lukaku needed this rest. I've said it before. He was he looked very fatigued before he got injured. I was talking to my my friend from Belgium. He was asking me, how's Lukaku coping? And I said, he's doing brilliantly, but he needed that injury. He needed that rest. He was playing too much football. And I'm confident that he'll come back in December with all these fixtures. And, you know, he'll score at least, you know, one or two every game from there on. So, um, so yeah, he needed that injury. But at the same time, I'm glad also Havertz is finding his form now. And I'm happy to see him start tomorrow. With with Havertz and uh, Lukaku, it's important we don't get into the habit of comparing them as as nines because they offer completely completely different different things. Whereas Lukaku would occupy a defender for ninety minutes, uh, you know, step on their heels, be be a bit physical, just always working, always running them down. With Havertz, it's more about I feel it's more about the moments in a game. You know, I don't think he is going to bully and and you know, have the better of a defender for 90 minutes. That's just the reality of it. Mm. But as long as his link-up play is is there, they will try and step on his heel. They will try and rough him up. But I feel like he is adapting to that. And then in a game, I feel he will he will get chances. Whether it's one or two chances or, or five or six, that's to be seen. But it's all about him. It's all about him taking these moments or making the most of these chances in opposed to you know, trying to watch him up front and thinking, you know, he's going to bully defenders, he's going to run them ragged for 90 minutes. I, I don't think that's going to happen. And what he's proven now in these, you know, in the past three or four games is that one or two moment that may come, he's pouncing. And that's, I think, you know, if someone is not a natural number nine, that's all we can ask for right now. And hopefully that continues. Yep. yep. I, I agree. I think, you know, he's, he's definitely found a lot of form. And you, you, I agree with you as well. You know they, they are completely different in terms of Lukaku and what Havertz brings to the game as well. But I, I think he's gonna. I think he'll do well. I think he'll do well in that game. I think, like you said, as long as he gets a service, which is the key thing, the link up plays there as well. I, you know, I can't. I can't see us losing the game. I'm gonna be honest. I, I say this every week when we record. Um, I think Leicester. I think at the moment they're 14th, are they, or something like that? I think in the league 12th. 14th. I don't, um, I don't look at the second half of the table. I just <laughs> the, the only thing yeah. I would say with, with Leicester at the King Power is against top four teams, they, they do get up for it. They, they yeah, do yeah, that's true. You know, um, yeah. I don't think they're the type of team that bounce off form, but rather mm. the occasion. Um, you look at them, I don't know, what was it Man United 5-3? Five, five, 4-2. 4-2. Yeah, yeah. four, four, yeah, four, yeah. four, the big scoreline. That was just, the stadium was buzzing. The stadium mm-hmm. was absolutely rocking, and you felt like the fans played a big part in that, in that victory. And obviously, with champions of Europe um, turning up in town, they're going to be up for it, you know. And I feel like it's more to it's more to do with if we can deflate them early on, 
then I think we'll go on yeah. and, and we Early will goal. and we will and we will win comfortably and we will play better than them and we will dominate them. Whereas if we let them I don't know, you know, score early or have, you know, a lot of possession early on, that could build. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the fans are definitely um never been to the King Power, but I think the fans there were definitely the twelfth man hundred percent. But I think if we can kill that game early, get an early goal, quieten down the crowd and yeah. start playing our game, control the game as well. I think that's that's vital in games like this. I, like I said earlier, it always worries me because you don't know what Leicester's gonna turn up, but they do tend to turn up for the big ones for the you know the big games as well. So it's gonna be interesting. Um in terms of your squads, what would you what would you go with? What 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 would the lineup feel? I'll go with you first. What would you how would you like I mean, it? It's just Leicester side. It's literally impossible predicting a two core lineup this season because it always, you know, differs to what you think it will be. Or, but as I said, I think a lot of those players that didn't travel will will start. So I think it'll be Alonso at left wing back over Chilwell, who played I think both international fixtures for England, if I'm not mistaken. I think it'll be a back three of Christensen, Rudiger, and um, Chiloba. I think Chiloba will start. And then it's so hard between Aspi because, and um, I'm not sure how many games Aspi played for Spain, um, but I think Reese James, obviously now being a bit younger, maybe will start it. And then midfield, I think Jorginho Kante, Mount, and then a front, and then I think Mount, I think Hudson Odoi deserves to start again. So Mount and Hudson Odoi, and then I think Havertz up front. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd, go with, I'd go with a very, uh, a very similar lineup to that. I think it's important because. Leicester have quick forwards. They're they're a transition type of team with with counter attack. They're not gonna they're not gonna outplay you off the park. So, what they will do is they'll wait for us to kind of attack, and then the long balls over the top for Vardy to sprint into the corners for Iniacho, Lookman, like you're saying, Madison spreading the passes. I think it's important to have James in the team for something like that, mm-hmm. um, just to bring that you know that natural aggression to kind of say you know we're ready we're ready to go for this. Chalaba definitely I think has to play in there as well. Um, and Rudiger and Christiansen, and I would go with Alonso at left back, um, just yeah. because you know he's a wise head. He's a wise head, yeah. and he's one of those players as well. Whatever occasion you put him in, you feel like he just plays his game. Um, and yeah, with the midfield, I'd go with uh, Kante, Jorginho, uh, Mason Mount, Havertz, and uh, Hudson Odoi. I think I'd go. Uh, yeah, I'd go with the same as uh, Theo. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't just... play Loftus Cheek. I wouldn't play Loftus Cheek in, in in this game because, like I said, I think the game will be tick for tack. It'll be quite a basketball game, in my opinion. Um, and I think he can get lost in games like that. Whereas Kante will give you that energy and he will buzz around. Yeah, and I mean Kante's brilliant tracking back as well. He's also good going forward, which is part of a game, part of his game that he's been a, been able to adapt as well. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, it makes more sense Kante played in that role. And, you know, we know Thomas Tuchel is not scared to change things if, you know, half time comes and something needs to change. You know, he'll definitely do that as well. So it's options on the bench that we've got, which is good. It's a luxury that we've got in the squad at the moment. But two key players, which Thomas Tuchel did mention in this morning's press conference was Andreas Christensen and Antonio Rudiger, who are currently ongoing um, discussions with their contracts. I'd, I'd say out of the two, I think Andreas Christensen seems to be the more realistic one to get that over the line. And I think, if I'm honest, I think Thomas Tuchel would be happy to get one of the two. Um, yeah. You know, he's not going to allow two quality centre-backs to leave the club at the same time. So I think Christensen seems like the more realistic one. Antonio Rudiger's still pushing for this, you know, 400 grand a week, I think, which we have spoke about on here before. But there's also been conversations around Wesley Fofana. If we do lose one of the two, of Wesley Fofana coming in. So I'll start with you, Theo, first. In terms of Christensen, who I think we've both said we'd gladly like to see stay at the club. We'd like to see both of them stay at the club. I don't think it's a case of we want either of them to go, but for the right money, I think we need to keep, realistically, Christensen seems like the, the one that's going to get done first. Would would you would you be happier with Christensen staying or would you rather... If it was one had to leave, which one would it be? <laughs> I suppose it's a question. I, I rather both stay, if I'm completely honest. I mean, those two players you mentioned, Christensen and Rudiger, probably you know saw the biggest renaissance under Thomas Tuchel when he arrived in January. I mean, Christensen looks the more likely, like you said. He wants the he wants the extension. Tuchel wants the extension. The club wants the extension. 
So if I had to pick one, it would be Christensen um, or Rudiger. You know, I think his mind is more of Chelsea, whereas Rudiger, if he's demanding, you know, this ludicrous sum of money, clearly maybe it may be only 80 or 70% of him wants to stay. You know, if he wants to be realistic, he needs to ask for less money if he really wants to stay in the club and love the club. But um, dream would be to have both of them stay and even Silva to extend. Fofana is a class player, don't get me wrong, but it was so important to build on what we've got already and try to not let any players leave. And then we've got Chaloba as well as a, you know another option. So um, if we go, I'd love both of them to stay, but if I had to pick one, Christensen simply um, simply because he's demanding less money, and um, I think he's he's slightly younger as well. Um, he's a, yeah, much younger. And he didn't get he didn't get Lampard sacked. True. Yeah, I'm still there. <laughs> I've forgiven. I've forgiven really good for I that. I haven't forgotten that. I haven't forgotten yeah. that. I'm not going to lie. There's a small yeah, part of me that still, that still has yeah. a bit of a... I forgot about that, to be fair. Yeah. I forgot. But um, he's, he's made... I think he redeemed himself for the way that he played it yeah. after yeah. that. But it's, it's a yeah. big thing. I think, I think what worries me about Rudiger is... I think I've mentioned it on here before. I don't want him to sign his big contract and then the standard of his defending or the the, mm. the play that we've got currently drops, which you, we've seen in players before um, with other clubs. And, you know, when you're on that much money, you don't necessarily have to put in that extra 10% because you're getting the money anyway. And I think that's that's my worry. I think if he was realistic about staying at Chelsea and being here for many years, the money wouldn't necessarily be the deciding factor for him. I think the fact that he's got these players around him which are also um you know quality defenders and we've got world class players in other areas of the team that would would be my selling point for me i think i'm on enough money already i've got you know i've got a lifestyle that i've set up in london which is brilliant but to to ask for that money i'm not saying is right or wrong because it, it's what he expects you know he's he's it's the football world you can demand what you want but i just think by Munich, which I believe are willing to give him those money, the, the funds that he wants, you know, that, that contract that he's after, the German link up there with him being German, German as well, he might he might end up going to Germany and that brings in a Wesley for far in a row. It brings in more gains for Tre- Trevor Chalabar as well. So, um, Haida, I'll ask you the same question. I think, it, it I think it's very important we don't, and, and history shows this as well, we don't get taken hostage by any players um, and we don't become that type of team where you know, players start bouncing off each other and then the agents are involved and, and then it just becomes very unstable, you know. Um, and I think Marina has already showed us that she's a great negotiator and she's willing to, to go toe-to-toe with, with anyone, you know. Um, so from that perspective, I'm, I'm not worrying in terms of the Rudiger deal because if it's going to be done, it will be done. And I believe it, w- it will suit Chelsea if, it, if it's going to happen. I don't think we will ever do a deal with any player if it doesn't suit us and if we're taken hostage by the situation. So I, I do take comfort from that. With regards to Christiansen, I, th- I think it's a done deal. I think it's a done deal. He's, he's Chelsea through and through. I think, personally, I think he's just not the type of player that wants to make a big deal about it. Um, I think he's trying to focus on his football. And in a season where he's kind of, you know, almost cemented his place in the team and he's getting all these plaudits, I think he's just kind of being tunnel visioned right now and just, I want to focus on my football, and the contract will be a done deal when, when it comes to that to that moment. So I don't ha- I don't have a worry with him, but just to go back on Rudiger, I do believe he is he is an unstable player. Um, some managers don't like it. Some managers work off it uh, in a way to to you know boost the players around him and stuff. A lot of players have come out. A lot of Chelsea players have come out and said that he is a bit of a He's a bit of an alpha in the uh, in the change room, you know. He's he's a very powerful man, very aggressive man, and he will speak up when it when it needs to be spoken up. You can take good from that, but it's just a matter of is it balanced and has it gotten to the point where he believes he's you know he's privileged to all these things, all these big contracts and all these all these big money contracts as well. I I don't think any player is so in that perspective. I would take Christensen. To answer yeah. to answer that question, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we've yeah, definitely. we've definitely mentioned that before. That you know, um, we do good business. And we've always done good business as a club, and I don't. Yeah. I agree trust, with you. I trust it, trust it. Yeah. You know, I, I I think based on previous players who we've let go, you know, the ones plus thirty who wanted a two year deal and they've only got offered the one, we've never you know buckled and said you know what you can have your two years. It's it never really happened. So I, I think in this scenario, we would be willing to allow. Really got to leave or to talk to other yeah. clubs uh, in January, if it means that we're going to be able to then free up the money that 
he was getting paid anyway to allow that for someone else like a Kunde who we've been linked yeah. with before as well yeah. who is on similar sort of scale in terms of quality for me in terms of what we've got from really got in the past as well but I think for me Christensen's the one I think he's the future he's, he's I think really good 28 now so I think Christensen's 25 24 something like that yeah. so we get an extra you know you, you can play center back to your 30 34 if you keep yourself fit um so for me personally I think Christensen would be the one that I'd like to see over the line I agree I think it's a done deal I think it's probably just crossing the um the dot in the eyes crossing the t's whatever they say um getting that over the line is is perital for me I think we've got to get that done but let's talk about Theo's favorite player or one of his favorite players who's having a torrid time in Real Madrid at the moment Eden Hazard we spoke about him before I know we spoke about him on the podcast but it's a, it's a name that we can't shift. We can't get rid of this name, Aiden Hazard, back at the club. Um, I saw you, Theo. He's obviously a, a big um, part of Chelsea in terms of what he did while he was at the club. He's having a ridiculously awful time in um, Madrid at the moment, um, plagued, obviously, with injuries for, throughout his career there as well. But this story has risen again in terms of um, Hazard coming back to Stamford Bridge. I said at the time that I wouldn't take him. Has your decision changed or your, your stance on it changed? It's very 50-50 still. Um, the closer we get to January and the closer, you know, the, the more of these rumours that we're seeing, you know, come December and come, you know, January time, I think there's more truth, you know, in the, in the rumours. Um, and it seems to be a pattern as well. If this, every time we record these podcasts, every three, four weeks, we always talk about Eden Hazard back to Stamford Bridge. So if we're still talking about him come, you know, last week of December, I think it's going to happen. I'm seeing a lot more, you know, truth in these rumours, as I said. And do we need him? No. Do we want him? Yes. That's what, you know, we should be saying. Um, if a player like Ziyech keeps not underperforming, but, you know, indicating that he isn't to the level of maybe a Pulisic amount, then maybe there's no harm bringing a player back to Hazard. The, the, the move would, you know, scream, you know, a lot of commercial value as well to it. You know, selling shirts, you know, a lot of um, publicity behind the move. Um, I would love to see Hazard back, you know, someone who goes to Stanford Bridge at every game. I've never really had that player, maybe apart from Drogba, who came back, you know, a second time, you know, have that maybe Lampard as manager, Mourinho as manager. But as a player, apart from Drogba, I can't think of a single player who came back and had that, you know, reception, you know, from the stadium. And they just create that buzz and atmosphere. And to have that halfway through a season would be quite special as well. But then again, you wouldn't want to you know, damage what we've already done this season in terms of building this kind of, you know, squad, having, I think, every player in this current squad right now is playing a part, playing a role. And I wouldn't want to add someone to that who might penalise someone else's, you know, fortunes or game time. But at the same time, I think if there's one player that I would make an exception for, it is Eden Hazard. So it's he's, like, not, he's not backing down on it, is he? He's, I keep, I keep he's, 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 he's going to deal with this. I keep that tracking. So it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a small part of me, there's a small part of me that Chelsea fan from, you know, 2019 that watched the final in Baku, that watched that mm. exceptional performance in Baku, that still thinks he has it in him. So, you know, if we can get that back, you know, <clears> that <throat> same hazard that left in 2019 back to Stamford Bridge, then we've got a world-class player. And I still think he is world-class. I just don't think Real Madrid, the Real Madrid physios, Ancelotti and before Zidane were getting the best that. out you of You can't him. lose that sort of talent. You don't. You can't lose you it, can't exactly. You can't lose that sort of talent. Yeah. So no, I, I think I, yeah. I would take him back. <laughs> I'm, I'm whispering it almost. I'm whispering it. <laughs> you know what it is? In the back of my mind, um, I've got I've got the situation with Ronaldo and Man United. Um, mm -hmm. When when Ronaldo came to Man United, and even when the rumours started happening a day before, we saw the reaction from Man United fans. Every single one of them wanted it. And there was that emotional response of nostalgia, you know, thinking of the past, all the memories, all the all the great, great times, the goals and stuff. And then and you kind of picture going forward that this will happen again. It's a given because, you know, you, you're thinking it's the same fit. If it doesn't work out for us, then I don't I think it's, it will cost us a league. That's that's how big that's how big of a uh, uh, a mistake it could end up being. Um, so it's all about, you know, do we want to connect emotionally and just bring something back just for the sake of good times and stuff? I think we're, we're, we're the club's driven now in the sense that 
I don't think he's going to come back. I don't think it's realistic that they'll back down and and change the policy of, you know, bringing in youth, um, all these kind of uh, uh, fast players and stuff, you know, in the, in the attacking sense, and just switch that all up and throw someone in there that's kind of a lot different technically to a, any other player we have right now. Um, so do I want it personally deep, deep down? Yeah, yeah, I do. Realistically, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the right move for, for us right now. Especially yeah. if he's going to bring his his injury situation back to to the bridge, it's, it's it's a difficult one because I feel I feel like, and I said this before that yeah, it, it, for Chelsea fans it'd be brilliant you know to see him back at Stamford Bridge week in week out, but that would be at the expense of someone who, you know, like you just said said then we've got younger players coming through now, and I I always I think use Christian Pulisic who I think is a brilliant player if you know kept wrapped in bubble wrap and, you know, we can try and keep him fit. I think bringing Aiden Hazard back would be, commercially would be brilliant. Obviously, his shirt yeah. styles would go through the roof and I'm sure there'd be other sort of sponsors and stuff around that. But at the expense of another player, I wouldn't want to see him back. And the only thing, sorry to, sorry to cut you off, the only thing I would say is we do have in that position room to get rid of players. So you're looking at a, a, a Ross Barkley and then you're looking at a Hakim Ziyech. I don't think they'll be here in the summer, come the summer. And maybe I one of them, if not both in Christmas, you know, mm. just depending on if we're going to bring... So if, if those two go, um, I does, it does free up a position for, for someone to come in. But the only thing that worries me about doing that is if we, we free up those two positions and then Eden Hazard's sidelined for three months or, you know reoccurring injury yeah, happens you get that, that's, so, that's my point that's my point too no yeah, I, I agree then, with you in that sense yeah yeah so it, I mean that would be brilliant to see him come back and if we can keep him fit which I, I doubt very much we can because we're struggling to do that with the likes of Pulisic and we've had I think well we've had quite a lot of injuries this season already so that kind of tells you that just the the fact of how many games we're playing yeah. is Aiden Hazard going to be able to compete with that level I personally don't think he will um, I'd love to see him back obviously but I just, I just can't. I think what I read earlier this morning. I think it's meant to be a loan deal um, initially, and maybe then with the option to buy at the end of that. But it just so, sort of screams to me, don't do it. And I think for, the only reason I say that is because at the expense of someone else. We haven't really given Hakim Ziyech for me enough game time to to really assess him. And I, I think you know, we... with with Hakim, I just think he's not suited for the club. Personally, yeah, I no, think, I, I've said that before. Not even before, just his but... play, um, I think his personality, body language, um, I've body language his um, yeah, I've his attitude. attitude, and and yeah. this isn't this isn't a race thing or anything. But a lot of Dutch players, people from the Dutch, even though he's not Dutch himself, but he's lived in Holland all his life, they do come with an arrogance, you know, that Van Persie type of I'm the best, you know, and and there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think it suits the type of the type of team we are right now. Mm. Um, it'd so be, I would be interesting. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting because I think if we if we do move him on, which wouldn't be a bad thing, and we did bring in someone like Hazard, for me, I, I think it will do more bad than good. The thing even with Hazard, with Hakim Z, even yeah. with Hakim Ziyech in the team now, and he's not really playing as much, and he's always injured, and yeah. we spoke about his attitude and stuff. I just think bringing in a Hazard would probably hamper that more, even more. If that makes sense, it would be the worst yeah. out of the two. But it's, it's all ifs and buts because we don't know if Hazard's going to stay fit. If we can keep him fit, we've yeah. got a really good player. The, only, the and, only positive you, know? you can you can take from Hazard himself is he's not a Ronaldo in the sense that he'll come and disrupt or, or no, you know, no, he's, no. he's going to throw his toys out of the pram. And, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the only positive in terms of he's on the bench for the most of Real Madrid games now. If he comes to Chelsea and he's on the bench... There's not a big difference to what's happening now. I just feel like he'll be happier in London, um, in a club where he's loved by fans who, you know, adore him. Whereas over in Madrid, it's, it's quite brutal, you know, even with injuries that the fans can be quite brutal to you. And yeah. and we know that he's the type of guy that just wants loving. Mm. It, it just seems like that, you know, the prince of the bridge, you know, he's just... So, the, so, the, yeah, the, last so thing, the last thing I want to say about Hazard before we revisit this in two, three weeks, I know we will... <laughs> Is um I know that um that one, the one thing that gives me a bit of hope about his injury record and if he should if he were to come back to Stamford Bridge is that I've been told 
Real, the Real Madrid like physios and fitness routines are quite intense. And that's what's mm. caused them a lot of injuries. Mm. And we've seen it with Sergio Ramos last season. So should he maybe he come back to Stamford Bridge or Chelsea or the Premier League, then there will be a bit more maybe consistency in, you know, him his fitness and him staying fit. So that gives me a bit of hope. And also you the Real Madrid fans are very impatient. We saw even with Bale and yeah. Ronaldo, yeah, yeah. two two three bad games, they start you know chasing their cars and leaving the Bernabeu. <laughs> and all it's that. brutal. It's brutal there. It's yeah. brutal. Well, that would never yeah, yeah. happen. That's Anthony Bridge, Chevchenko, Torres. When they underperformed, they, all they got from Chelsea was love. Yeah. So um, even if he's he plays two three games in a six month loan, he comes in, he'll get nothing but love from the Chelsea fans. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. There's strong rumours for him to uh, Newcastle, wasn't there? That's just about to get onto that. That's <laughs> not thing, because for me, that's a very realistic signing. That's a very no, realistic more, signing. I think that's you know? more realistic than coming to Chelsea. And the, the only reason I say that is because he would fit in. He'd get more game time. I think he... I think, and he would attract other players. Yeah, you know, I it, think it just fits with the model and the structure the of what they're trying signing. to do. You're not playing much there. You know, come here, take whatever you want. Maybe bring yeah. a few Belgiums. Would you just... I think, I think it would suit Newcastle much more than us. But I wouldn't want to see that. I don't want Hazard getting relegated. I don't want Hazard getting relegated. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the Newcastle yeah, that would be imagine that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I mean, we like you said, I'm sure we'll revisit this in you know two or three weeks, um, especially more so when the window opens and you know deadline day and everything that comes with it. But um, let, let's let's move on to Conor Gallagher, who had a, a really interesting training match against San Marino. Um, <laughs> it's better than it Smith a... Rowe. Let me get that in for the Arsenal fans before before we carry on. Yeah, because I, I, yeah, yeah, again, I did see something on um, Twitter about who's the better, you know, Smith Rowe or Conor Gallagher. And I just think you look at the two, well, I can't really compare the two, first of all, but I think in terms of what Patrick Vieira has done with Conor Gallagher at Crystal Palace so far this season, you can see leaps and bounds in their progression. It's, it's, it's clear as day for me. So, um, Theo, I'll bring it over to you. Yeah. San Marino. He came on I mean, as a sub, didn't he? I think he came on second half. Didn't didn't catch the game. Watched the highlights. Thought he played particularly well. I think he hit the post. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he did. He's yeah. Unlucky not to score. And in terms of his call up, it's fully deserved. You know, we kind of criticised Southgate on the previous episode, saying he's not picking players based on merit and form. You know, when he was picking the likes of Cody, Mings, Ward Prowse and those type of players. But, you know, the Gallagher call-up maybe shows a bit of truth in that. And um, I think it is well-deserved. I do think he'll be in, two, in um, Southgate's plans from now on, especially if he keeps it up under Palace, uh, for, for under, under Vieira at Palace. And what you say, Ida, about comparing him to Smith Rowe, I think for now it's quite harsh to compare them because one's playing for Palace and one's playing up for Arsenal, even though maybe those teams now, if you want to be They're realistic. The same, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I think once Hakala gets back at Chelsea next season, then I think that's when you can make real comparisons to you know top top players. But um, every sign is promising for now for Gallagher. Uh, in the preseason, I thought you know he's another player, a bit like Broha, that you know he's got a part to play. But whether he'll be at Chelsea next season, I don't know. But he's made such progress this year. Um, you know we saw him at West Brom; he was decent last year. But you know you can't really show off your ability at a West Brom. Same where we saw with Loftus Cheek at Fulham. A team that's you know destined for relegation is hard to really show off, but now with this Vieira side, I think he's really impressed me. I'm really am um, happy. Um, we'll get our Crystal Palace friend back on soon and talk about Gallagher yeah, yeah. because I think it's um it's yeah we 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 full of praise. But um I'm really excited. You know him and Gilmore, are the two players that I think will be back next summer. Definitely. Yeah, I think like you said about San Marino being San Marino. Um, but I think it it was a good game to come into. Um, just to kind of get that first cap. I don't know if you guys saw the video of Southgate handing him his uh, mm. his cap with with all the pizza boxes in the, uh, in the <laughs> room. I didn't um, see it. But you can tell from his face, he was it was like a kid, you know, just something he's always dreamt of and, and how much it meant to him. Um, so I think that's going to do him the world of good. He seems like a level-headed player. Doesn't seem like the type to, to kind of get ahead with himself. Um and, you know, there was a lot of people saying, should we bring him back in, in Christmas, in the in December window? Definitely not. Definitely, definitely, definitely not. Because uh, we said this in the last podcast as well. He's working under the perfect manager for him right now. And I put a lot of Crystal Palace success down to that because he's, he's Vieira's general on that pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could, only, that could only do well for him. And, you know, 
forget the San Marino Cup. I think he's probably sitting there thinking, I want to be at that World Cup. You mm. know, I, 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 I want to be on the plane to that World Cup. I don't just want one or two caps. So going forward, for that to happen, he has to be playing most games week in, week out. So I think it's a given that he will stay at Crystal Palace. Um, and then and then looking forward to next season, I said this in the last podcast as well, I think him and Mount will be will be competing for that place um, in the midfield. Um, and I'm and I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm here for that battle. I, I agree. I agree with that a lot. I think um, I think for me, I just want to see that more consistently in the league as well. I mean, yeah. we're only talking about what is it, eleven or twelve games in the league now? I've lost yeah. track. But in terms of him as as a player, I think he's definitely coming on leaps and bounds. He's heading in the right direction. I think over the next say six months or so, however many months are left in the season. I think that's when we'll get the true assessment of how great of a player he could be or he, he will be as well. I think he's um, he's got everything about him. He's got he's got everything that is perfect for Chelsea. But I do think as well, like I said in a few other episodes, I do think Palace might try and hold on to him and they might actually put a, a relatively decent bid in for him. Uh, I think he's um, out of the two. I think, and I think I said this before, I might have changed my mind, I can't remember. But I think I can see Billy Gilmore coming back after his loan deal. Um, Norwich are pretty much dead and buried. They, they, you know, they're back in the championship mentally probably already. But I think Crystal Palace are building something there, and I think he's the, the spine of, of that squad at the moment. And I think he's the, the sort of player that Patrick Vieira would want to hold on to. So I think in terms of his development, it's, it's brilliant. But I think again, you know, if he wants to try and get on the plane, he probably suit him more to be it. A, a palace, you know, a, a it happened made. with Loftus Cheek, didn't it? When he got yeah, into yeah. the World Cup uh, squad, he, True, he had yeah. a season at Palace, and, and that's what got him in. And I yeah. think he will be looking at that as as a platform for himself. Yeah. Um, and yeah, with Billy Gilmore, it's, I think he needs to come back. It's, it's, it's just gonna it's gonna no, affect uh, everything. Dean Smith, I think Dean Smith has said that he said he wants to give him game time, so let him stay another six mm. months there, play some football, and come back in the summer. Um, once Pat Norwich get relegated, it's brutal, but it's true. It's pretty much. It's pretty. Much, I bet they're probably suspended betting on it now. I think they, there's no way you can probably put money on them. But um, yeah, we'll have to see how Connor gets on. I think, like I said, you know, he's he's definitely a talent. He's definitely better than Smith at the moment. That's not even a debate to have on this podcast. But yeah, definitely better than Smith Rowe. Um, let's take it to Tuesday. Big game. Return to. Champions League football against Juventus, which is arguably going to be our most difficult game of the group. I think. What's your, I just what's your want thoughts? to see what the uh, the league tables say for the uh, for the Champions League. Champions, oh, Champions League. League. Yeah, I think what situation are we in? We're three points behind them, I think, because they yeah, yeah. they beat us. Points. We're second with three points behind Juventus. They beat us in Italy in Turin. They if we beat them. them, if we beat them. I think it goes down to head to head before goal difference, if I'm not mistaken. Which is again not in our favour because I think um yeah, they're they're sort of ahead yeah, of us in that. If they get some kind state. of away goal, if they get some kind of away goal at Stanford Bridge, then yeah, they're, yeah. they're the favourites. But um yeah. then again in the Champions League you know how it is, even if you finish first, you still get That's some it, isn't it? That's you know, it. Exactly. You know, probably PSG can potentially finish um second in their group behind City or vice versa. I know we can't draw an English team. But um, ideally, I'd love to finish top of the group. Um, I think it's going to be a very, very tough game Tuesday. I just, if we play like we did in Italy, there's no chance we're going to win this. I do expect that we'll learn from mistakes on Tuesday and we'll we'll perform better. Um, I can see it almost us scoring early and then trying to hold on to that lead, almost like what they did in Italy. Um, and then we have the ability to hold on to leads now, except for that Burnley game. So I would, wouldn't mind that, but it'll be a nervy second half. Italy do have um no, Italy, uh, Juventus do have those players. I think I say I called him out in the last game, Chiesa, and he was the one who scored. He's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And Delete would be linked with him as well, alongside Fafana and Kunde, also a fantastic young centre back. But then uh, player, you know, actual quality. We, you know, we I think we have the better squad domestically. We're doing better than Juventus, so um, I do want, I do think we can win. But I think it's going to be a question of who wants it more on the night and who's got the better defense as well. Because Juventus might go into the game just thinking all we need is a draw and we can, you know, we can top the group. So yeah. um, it's going to be almost a game. You know, the game will be won. You know, who's got the better defense, arguably? And I think we can break down this Juventus defense over ninety minutes. Maybe get an early goal 
and then make them think, shoot, actually, we need to score now and then, you know, bite them on the counter attack. Yeah, definitely. I think. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Sorry. Be... Go, go, go ahead. No, go. go. I was, I was going to say that their style, um, it's perfect to play a team like us. Mm. Uh, we, we, we have possession and then they love sitting back and hitting on the counter. So I do think we have to bring something else to, to the table if we want to, if we want to get all three points, we can't go with the normal, normal kind of gameplay that we go for. Yeah. I, I think as long as we, we don't sit back and invite the pressure, which yeah. I think is what we're looking to, we look, we try to do, um, in the, the return leg as well, the return fixture, but. We need we need to score some serious goals in that game. If I'm honest, I think we need to 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 hit them on on the front foot, and we need to again. It's going to be interesting. Is is Lukaku going to be fit for yeah. that game? I, I think if he if he is, then I, I'll be more optimistic that we might win. But I think if we, it's, it's a strange one because obviously we're playing early on Saturday, then we've got the game on Tuesday. There's not much time in between that to assess the plays that we want in the game. You know, a Verde or a Lukaku as well, but. It's gonna, you know, you have to, to win anything, you have to play the best teams, and you have to to play in difficult situations, and this is one of them. So, you know, um, we did it last season in the Champions League. We have to do it again here as well. So, I, I just think it's gonna be, it's gonna be a difficult game. It's gonna be the hardest game I think out of all of the the groups, that, um, group games that we've had so far. Um, I, I do agree. Obviously, domestically we're doing better, but. Who knows? It could be, you know, Juan Cuadrado gets a, a screener from 20 yards. Stubborn teams. Stubborn teams, yeah, the Italians. Yeah. Very, very stubborn yeah, teams, yeah. you know. Cellini and Benucci as well. Hard defenders to break down. Very Definitely. hard. Definitely. So Can't I think it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a completely different game to Leicester. It's, it's, it's obviously, um, like I keep saying, it's going to be the most difficult game for me personally. Um, I think we're all there. I think we're all at that one, aren't we? I'm down for the game. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm going as well, yeah. Yeah, so it's gonna be it's gonna be uh interesting. I think, predictions, predictions for both Leicester and Juventus now. Four. Let's start with Leicester. Let's go first. Um, one nil Chelsea. I'm gonna go for a two nil Chelsea at Leicester. I'm gonna go with two one simply because maybe Brendan Rodgers, his mind might be with another club potentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we spoke about that before, but I think I might. You know, he's a professional, but I think there is some truth in the United rumours. So um, I'll say 2 1 Chelsea. Yeah. And, and I think um, for in, in Juventus, I'm going to go for a 1 1 draw. I'm going to go for 2 0 Chelsea. I'm going to go 1 0 again. I think it's going to be another 1 0. I think we're going to, yeah, I think we're going to struggle without having sort of Lukaku up there against those centre backs you mentioned. So. Yeah, one nil again. But um, just before we wrap up, as always, you can follow us on our socials. So we've got our our Twitter handle at the bottom. If you're watching on YouTube, hopefully you can see that there as well on our Instagram. Um, but if you can't and you're listening on Apple or Spotify, it's at from the shed ends on Twitter, and it's at from the shed ends with underscores between each of the words on Instagram as well. So we're on YouTube. Like, subscribe, comment. Let us know your thoughts on this episode and any other episode you watch as well. Um, but yeah, this has been episode 36 from the Shed End. As always, Theo, Haida, thank you for joining me. Thank we'll you. Back. We'll be back next week, I think. We'll, we'll be back to hopefully um, have two victories on our on our belts um, yeah. with Leicester and Juventus. But this has been episode 36 from the Shed End podcast. Until next time, stay safe, stay safe and enjoy the football this weekend. It is back.